Thanks very much, Kelly. Appreciate everybody tuning in today. A little background in addition to what Kelly mentioned. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was a member of the institutional consulting group at Oppenheimer & Company where I began my work uh, in ERISA, primarily working with sponsors of defined benefit plans. So uh, I remember when a lot of these plans were very active and, uh, and, and, and the industry itself revolved around defined benefit plan consulting. Obviously things have changed 20 years later, but it's an interesting time that we find ourselves in. And so I'm very excited to be uh, one of the members that have been during the heyday of DB plans as well as this really important inflection point. So for those of you who are tuning in today, uh, I'm very excited to have you. A little bit about my firm is we are a hard dollar advocacy group that does consulting work for DB and DC plans. We've been doing that as a group for about 12 years now. Uh, and as, uh, as Kelly mentioned, we also do some special project engagements for the government regulators and class action litigation. Today what we're going to talk about is we're going to give a little bit of a lead in as to exactly how we got here. Uh, the recent historical backdrop, I won't get into the details about what's been going on and the consolidation and termination of defined benefit plans, but really what happened since the financial crisis, during the financial crisis that got us to the exact conditions of defined benefit plans that we find ourselves in now. I'm going to mention where we are now, give a quick snapshot on what the industry, the environment looks like today. Uh, and then most importantly, we're going to try and project what is a likely scenario going forward so that we hopefully can plan for future events and strategies. At the end of the day, you all tuned in because we are ultimately looking for or interested looking for that sweet spot. Where is the proper time if we're interested in terminating our defined benefit plans? When is the optimal time to get out of them? We're also going to introduce a concept which may run against the grain of the industry today, but we think at least deserves heavy consideration for organizations that are looking to terminate. And we'll talk about that in a little bit of detail later, but we're going to introduce the concept called re-risking. It obviously is the anti of de-risking, which has been sold ad nauseum over the last six or seven years in the industry, and so we're going to talk about that concept. Next, we're going to mention, we're going to go into the, well, okay, if I do want to terminate and possibly consider re-risking, where are my advice resources going forward? And then we'll get into some of the more boring stuff if we have some time, timelines, timetables. Really, we just threw a lot of information into the back of this presentation that will be available for you later so you can use that as a guide in your termination process. So how did we get here? Well, for those of us who remember, and it wasn't hard to, uh, it wasn't hard to, to be awake during these very shocking events, during the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, we had some substantial gyrations in many things that affected defined benefit plans. Specifically, interest rates declined to historic lows. Uh, we had this massive risk off trade of where everybody sold anything that had any volatility associated with it at all, real estate, stocks, commodities, you name it, it was on sale. And everybody loaded into U.S. government bonds, forcing interest rates down. Top that off with some quantitative easing from the U.S. Fed, and we ended up with extremely low interest rates. As I mentioned, stock prices collapsed, which means that the majority of your defined benefit plan uh, net assets went down substantively during that time period. Stock declines in no way uh, were muted, uh, or I should say were not muted nearly enough uh, by the upside gains in most of the bond portfolios, and so net-net the funding ratios of a lot of plans went down. Right around that same time period, with all this shock to the system, what ended up happening was the concept of LDI, which had been around for a while, that's liability-driven investment strategies, was introduced, uh, was introduced much more aggressively, and started to get some looks from uh, finance officers across America. Fast forward into the first years of the recovery as we got into 2010 and 2012, what happened? Well, we actually had even more stimulus from the, uh, from the Federal Reserve, pushing interest rates even lower. That discount rate drop actually ended up hurting our PBOs our, and our funding ratios. That created quite a bit of a headwind as the discount, uh, as the discount model of uh, future liabilities obviously increased. 
We did have a really nice recovery in asset values because stocks recovered substantively in 2000 and late 2009, actually, all the way into 2012. And so what ended up happening was we ended up getting some relief. We ended up with funding ratios starting to climb a little bit because asset prices went up in a much broader way than the increase from the PBOs from the discount rate going down. At the same time, the U.S. government introduced two major relief measures, quote unquote relief measures, that allowed organizations to fund at a lower percentage or at a lower rate than they would have normally under the previous statute. What that did was that provided some relief for the financial coffers of organizations as they were trying to recover out of the recession. But what that did was that slowed the inflows of normal contributions into defined benefit plans and inevitably, I believe, ended up hurting the financial health of these defined benefit plans for those organizations that just sought to fund at their minimums. So where are we today? or certainly recent history. Well, obviously, we got some good news. In the, last, uh, in the last year, we finally had interest rates move back in the opposite direction. Uh, as the concept of the unwinding of Fed monetary stimulus started to work its way into the system, interest rates rose quite sharply. As a matter of fact, they went from approximately one and three quarters percent at the beginning of 2013 up to a full three percentage points in the end, by the end of 2013. That did have a negative impact on bonds in general, and the most dramatic example was U.S. government bonds that were on the long end were down a whopping 12.5%. As a matter of fact, if you looked at all the major asset classes in 2013, only Latin American emerging market equities were down more. That means the U.S. long bond was the second worst and most volatile performing asset in 2013. It's really shocking when you think about it. But it gives you an idea of how sensitive those types of vehicles can be to major interest rates rises. And obviously, we're, we're foreshadowing a potentiality in the future. Good news was that stock prices soared literally over 30% in most major U.S. Index indices. Japan was up a whopping almost 57%. And generally, with the exception of the emerging markets, the news was good. Um, bonds and alter certain alternatives were a drag on that equity performance, but generally speaking, the risk categories of most defined benefit plans did quite nicely, and the declines in most of the bond portfolios wasn't substantive enough to, add, to, to, to dampen those increases. What did we get? Nice rise in discount rates, substantial swelling in asset values, PBOs went down, and funding ratios went up very nice in 2013. We're going to talk a little bit about mortality rates in a second, but for those of you who have actually been paying attention, you know that our healing, if you will, of PBO descent actually wasn't quite as attractive because offsetting those rising interest rates, offsetting that discount rate, actually was a fact that we're starting to see longevity creep in into the tables, and that is starting to slow the curing, if you will. I'd like to actually introduce a poll at this particular moment in time. Um, for those of you that, uh, that, that have defined benefit plans, because I know we have a lot of consultants and advisors that are listening in as well, but for those of you that, uh, that do have defined benefit plans, I'm curious as to, uh, as to which ones of you uh, have an opinion one way or the other uh, about LDI strategies as a whole. So uh, with... And, <laughs> A little moment. Um, I'm going to uh, see if I can pull that poll in here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kelly. So if those of you can, uh, who do have defined benefit plans, if you could possibly uh, 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 weigh in on your polls here, we'd like to get a, 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 a viewpoint about where people are with the utilization of LDI. So if you could take a moment and click one of the radio buttons. I'll see if I can put the pointer back on here. Great. We'll give it another few seconds.
Perfect. I think we've got almost everybody in now. Uh, Kelly, if we can go ahead and, and end the poll and, and uh, provide those, uh, uh, those answers for everybody, that'd be great. So it looks like we've got fairly good utilization of LDI as a concept. Um, we have a little more than a quarter of the participants are using LDI actively. Uh, we have another, about, that looks like be about 14 out of 100 are thinking about employing LDI. And then a little better than half of you like LDI as a concept, but not in this environment. And I'm assuming that's due to the substantive low interest rates that we're finding. Um, that actually is a pretty consistent uh, gathering of what we've seen throughout our history over the last couple of years with the attitudes toward LDI. Um, once we do finally see, uh, once we do finally see interest rates rise up, it'll be interesting to see what kind of movement we get in those statistics. So for those of you who do have LDI employed in your plan, you're obviously aware um, if you've been analyzing your fund on a more uh, on a macro level and looking at the performance based on components, you probably have had some experience that's similar to this. You probably had a very good year in asset values, but because that long end of the government bond market was down as much as it was, you may have seen a little bit less of an asset rise than some of your peers who had not adopted LDI quite yet. So funding ratios did go up nicely for organizations that adopted LDI, um, with the exception of the ones that literally went uh, almost fully to, uh, to a fixed income strategy and were nearing termination. Uh, but they weren't as attractive uh, of a recovery as we saw with the organizations that had not adopted them as of yet. Just to give you a little statistic, um, amongst our peers, and we've looked across you know, several plans to get, to get a feel for this, uh, we've seen approximately, a, a little, it's actually a little bit more than a 30% exposure, but we just rounded that number down. Um, assuming a 30% exposure to long-term bonds in a typical LDI strategy, you would have lost about 300 basis points of recovery, or actually just absolute performance. Um, which would have dampened your funding ratio recovery by about three full percentage points. So that's about what LDI cost asset values in 2013. So the big question is, obviously the history lesson is really nice because history can tell us about the direction of things to potentially come or at least give us a good runway to take off. But the ultimate goal is, and I'm thinking that a lot of you are probably thinking the same thing, is where are we going from here? What does the end of 2014 and beyond look like? Well, ultimately, if you fall into the major uh, in investment banks and money management firms on the streets' opinions, uh, the world is looking for about 100 to 150 basis point rise in, in medium to long-term interest rates over the next three to five years. I will note that North Pier has a much more, uh, I think, aggressive uh, opinion about interest rates we were approximately double the forecast of the street last year, thinking interest rates were going to rise about 85 basis points in 2013. They ended up rising 125, so even our, conser our estimates turned out to be overly conservative. And we actually think that there's good reason for it. When you're J.P. Morgan or you're Mercer, it's very difficult if you think that interest rates were going to rise 20% next year to come out and say that. If you're wrong, you've got a lot of mud on your face, and if you are right, then you scare a lot of people. So I think that when you look at the major capital market assumptions that are published, you have to take them with a little bit of tempering that they can't probably say, or at least some of them can't probably say everything that they're thinking. At North Pier, we have a tendency to be a little bit more project-based and advocacy-oriented, so we can actually give our opinions. So we're actually looking at that 200 to 250 basis point rise between now and about, 200, about 2018. We are seeing global economic conditions stabilize and generally improve. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but we do believe that barring any major geopolitical or ecological event on the globe, that we're probably looking at better economic conditions globally. And if that does, in fact, turn out to be the case, stock prices are normally uh, not too far behind. One thing that we think that most of you have probably caught whiff of, but we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, is 
that PBGC insurance premiums are about to soar. 2015 is going to be a shocker, and 2016 is going to make 2015 look like a discount. So it's definitely something that organizations that have plans that are underfunded are really going to heavily want to factor in in the next two years for a lot of purposes. Again, we don't think that the mortality rate rises. Uh, we don't think any of, any of that news is shocking. We don't think any of that news is new, and we don't think any of that news is over. So as long as mortality rates continue to rise, we're going to continue to see head, headwinds in funding ratios recovering fully. By the way, a little statistic, and I have not been able to verify this. I read it a couple of different places, so treat, uh, to, you know, treat this uh, as, as, as one of those uh, potential fuzzy math numbers. But what I, what I read was, was that approximately for the average plan was that one full year of increased mortality ended up increasing, uh, I should say, decreasing funding, funding ratios by approximately 4 to 5%. That seems pretty, uh, pretty outstanding when you think about it. My suspicion is, is that as we all see the next decade or two unfold, that we're going to probably see another year or two tacked onto those mortality tables. So given the backdrop of what we think is highly likely to happen coming forward, uh, what are the potential solutions for those of us who are still considering terminating? And as a matter of fact, this is probably a really good opportunity for me to introduce that question, to get a sense of the audience and find out where you all are in your, uh, uh, your planning spaces. Um, let's take a little poll and find out, oops, hang on for one second. Uh, let's find out where you all are uh, in terms of your, your active, frozen, partially frozen, terminating, thinking about terminating phases. Kelly, will you introduce that poll for us? We'll take a second here for you all the way in. And for Looks those like of we've you got joining us, all you, coming in. I'm, I'm sorry, Kelly? Just said, looks like we've got some good feedback coming in. We do. We really, by the way, this feedback is very valuable, not just for us, but also I think the other members of the uh, of the webinar. Uh, all this information will be made available to you statistically after the session. So uh, not only does it help North Pier in terms of our planning and guidance, but I think it also helps your peers quite a bit. So thank you very much for actively voting. Great. We'll give this another couple of seconds, and I'll give you the results. This is, a, this is a very, very evenly dispersed uh, sampling. Uh, we've got a little less than a quarter of you uh, are showing that the plan is still fully active. Uh, only 10% of you are fully frozen at, pre at the present time. 30% of you partially frozen. Uh, and then, and I know that some of these, by the way, some of these are, wait, I want to pick two of them, <laughs> which is why I think the votes are moving around a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, certainly, uh, we've got uh, a, a constituency that's, that's chiming in here that they are either presently terminating or thinking about terminating. So um, nice, evenly, uh, evenly dispersed group. So we've got a nice sample to, uh, to draw on. Thanks, Kelly. So um, we're going to be speaking to the folks that either are terminating or are thinking about terminating. Um, at some point in time, uh, for most organizations, unless you're dealing with cash balance plans that, op that hopefully if the regulations apply, uh, apply to them, will allow them to operate in perpetuity. Uh, but for the folks of you that either are terminating or are thinking about terminating or aren't thinking about terminating but eventually probably will at some point in time down the road, um, let's take a look at your major option categories. Well, for some, terminating now or soon is definitely an option and it's definitely interesting. We've had a great increase in funding status, regardless of whether you may still be underfunded or not. Um, we've had a great, great uh, run up in, in asset values, and we finally have had the right move in interest rates, and hopefully we'll get a little bit more. So um, for some organizations, this is a good place to take our risk off the table. Um, just a little fact, by the way, um, the Milliman 100 PFI index for April showed that the average pension fund was 85% funded on an accounting basis. And by the way, that's all we're going to talk to you about today. I really, actuarial accounting, 
regulatory accounting, none of that really matters. If you're under MAP 21, that might be great in terms of funding ratios and compliance and also how much you're contributing. But at the end of the day, if we're tuning into this webinar, really what we want to know is, how much does it cost me to run my plan from today until I'm done with it? And the only number that really matters when we're talking about that is the accounting basis for, um, for cal uh, calculations. And so that's when, then when we're talking about funding ratios, that's what we're speaking about. And so the Milliman 100 at PFI for April just showed that the average pension fund swelled up to 85% funding status um, as of their last measurement, which is a great jump. It is presently estimated that the cost of terminating a plan will be somewhere between about 112 and change, let's call it 113% and 115% of your PBO. Okay, so if your obligations are 100 million, it's probably looking at about 113, 114, 115 million dollars to hit the button and get out of it today. So that gap is roughly about 30% for the average plan still. So even though planning, funding ratios have come up, we still have quite a ways to go. Well, conditions are better. Account, basically, we've, you know, we've got a lot of organizations that have a desire to eliminate this variability from their primary business considerations. And for some groups, it may just simply be time to go out and, 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 and finish the job. And so they're actually in termination now or are looking to terminate very soon. On the con side, Basically, it somewhat locks in suboptimal discount rates, even though the rates, the rates today are a very nice increase over where they were just last year. If you look at them in long-term parameters or even just compared to a few years ago, even at the beginning of the financial crisis, discount rates are actually still quite low, which means that the cost of going out and terminating a plan, whether you're buying annuities or whether you're doing lump sum payouts, the cost of that wind down is still going to be quite High. One good piece of news that might be able to counteract that, though, is for some organizations, if you have good credit standing and you've got room to borrow, because interest rates are so low, some organizations are actually choosing to go out and borrow the money to go ahead and close down those obligations. So there, there put, could be some counter cons to that, to that, that, uh, that scenario. What about the concept of de-risking, which has been talked about and continues to be talked about uh, all over the place. There are proponents of it. There are people selling it. There are organizations, especially large public organizations, that can't get enough of it because they want the, this, this item moved out of their, uh, their daily business blotter and they want it moved out of the press. So certainly for a lot of organizations, the concept of de-risking is very attractive. Again, conditions are better. Funding ratios have improved. All the same reasons that we talked about pros earlier. And though still not Basically, at their historic lows, long-term bond rates have become more attractive for LDI implementation than they were just a year or year and a half ago. And so for a lot of organizations that might be considering an LDI strategy, maybe now is the time that they start scaling in or implementing. The cons, again, you're still at historically low interest rates, locking in those suboptimal rates. Uh, and essentially, you're locking in your loss factor. Just a concept with this is that if your funding ratios went down substantively and your PBOs spiked because interest rates were pushed down artificially either through this flight to quality or a fear trade that went on five or six years ago during the financial crisis, and then the Fed intervention and stimulus that's ensued ever since, then essentially it may be looked at that the drop in funding ratios or that spike in PBOs wasn't real. I mean, that's why we instituted MAP21 in the first place, right, was that there was this theory that these discount rates weren't really real and certainly weren't going to be sustainable. And so then those, those funding ratios actually were artificially, uh, artificially under, understated. And so if that's the case, to lock in a de-risking strategy here or near here may be locking in that, that quote-unquote um, uh, phantom or artificially stimulated uh, interest rate environment in, instead of letting it heal and returning back to normal conditions. So just a little food for thought there. For a lot of organizations, we're starting to see people start to uh, look at the new concept, which is terminate tactically. In other words, okay, I like the idea of getting out 
of these plans. And by the way, so at North Pier, we consult to a lot of organizations that do mergers and acquisitions, and some of them actually end up acquiring these defined benefit plans through those M&A events. They, they never started these organizations. They never start, started these plans. And all they really did was assume the liability. So for them, really what they're trying to do is they're trying to maximize their exit points. So they're not, they don't want to be in the defined benefit plan business for long. Now that's also true of a lot of organizations that have them as legacy benefits as well. What are some of the benefits of possibly taking this approach? Well, if capital market assumptions, um, if the capital market assumptions that we have prognosticated do continue to unfold and interest rates rise, well, we're definitely going to get some, some curing in those PBOs um, as the discount rate rises. Further, asset values hopefully will go up, especially if duration risk is controlled in the bond portfolios, but at least from the stock side of things. And also, a nice companion to that is if interest rates go up, well, lump sum calculations go down. The present value calculation of a future, of a future liability becomes lower as interest rates rise. And the purchases of annuities become cheaper. By the way, a little fact right now, annuity purchases are basically somewhere in the low 3% rate for crediting interest right now. That's extremely low. So if we can get up to even 4 or 45 or 5% for an annuity purchase, you can imagine that the cost of purchasing annuities goes down very nicely. The cons to that, sorry, I've reversed the order here a little bit. Um, capital market, market assumptions could be wrong. I mean, if you took a poll in 2006, if you'd asked people whether they thought the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average was going to be below 7,000 in a year, I think you'd probably find very few people that would make that statement. Um, stocks could go down. Interest rates could stay low. They could even go lower. And ultimately, if any of those events happen, that could slow the path to plan termination. If things got really aggressive, and they did it before MAP21 relief uh, went away, we could actually see a major increase in funding obligations as well. So net-net, if things were, go, were to go awry or against plan, we could end up, uh, we could end up with a increase or meaningful increase to the net expense uh, of getting the plan termination. And at the end of the day, a lot of financial officers, that's really what they want to know. They want to know is how am I going to get out at the lowest total expense to me? Total expense means the check I might have to write when I do terminate the plan, as well as all the checks that I have to write from now until I, have, I get to the termination date. I guess that's maybe a good point in time for us to even segue to that question in the first place. Um, we make an assumption because Wall Street certainly has their opinions and North Pier has their opinions about interest rates, that interest rates are going to move in a certain direction. But for those of you, and actually we've got a lot of consultants on the line as well, so this is just as applicable for you as it is for those who actually operate defined benefit plans, I'd like to take a little bit of a poll here to find out exactly where do you see interest rates going. Let me load that poll in real quick. Kelly, can you introduce that poll for us? Yes, sir. Here we go, folks. If you would, just let us know your opinion. Where do you think interest rates are going to be in three to five years? Kelly, the next time we do one of these webinars, maybe we can get a little Jeopardy soundtrack behind the, the poll questions. Ooh, I'll look into that. Good idea. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Always looking to help. I think that everybody or most of the people who want to vote or have an opinion have at this point. Great, great. Well, I'm, I'm actually really, uh, uh, really quite happy to see that North Pier is not a lone wolf in our opinions that we're probably looking at better than 2% increases in those intermediate and long rates coming in the next few years. Uh, as I said, I believe that Wall Street and the major consulting firms have way too much to risk to tell the street what they really feel. Uh, and so it's probably really important that we have the opportunity to talk as a peer group and really get a sense of this because, as you can imagine, we already saw what just a one and change percent move in interest rates did to LDI strategies last year. Imagine what another two or 300 basis point move 
or more could possibly do to those potential strategies and our ability to possibly duck them. So that's great. We'll use that information going forward. Thanks, everybody, for participating with that one. That's very valuable. Well, that's a great question. Where is the sweet spot? So we've got this wonderful concept that interest rates are going up, that asset prices hopefully will continue to climb, uh, that maybe annuities get cheaper. Where is this golden, golden day of where if I could press a button and get out of my, my plan and terminate it, where would that be? Well, again, as we mentioned, um, when we went, we looked at over 10 major capital market assumptions for 2014, uh, a lot of names you know. Pretty much everybody's falling at least in this 100 to 150 basis point rise category. Uh, we've got some folks that think it's going to happen a little longer, but for the most part, everybody's saying by about 2020. As I mentioned, North Pier, we're looking at about 200 to 250 basis points by about 2018. We think it's going to happen a little bit quicker. Um, just because we see the massive knee-jerk moves that interest rates can make when everybody gets on one side of, of the thinking. We saw that last year. But I really want to draw attention to this, this item. I'm going to see if I can actually do my little crayon work here, Kelly. I know we practiced yesterday, but I didn't get too good with the, mar the magic marker. Um, let's see if we can do it. Maybe not. We'll try one more time. There we go. And I just want to draw your attention to this. Yeah, I, 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 might, I might look like I'm doing this with my left hand, but I'm actually doing it with my right. Um, if the Fed can't stay ahead of the ascent in interest rates, thanks, Kelly, um, then we could see something much more substantive than a 2 or 250 basis point rise in interest rates. You all probably remember watching CNBC just a couple of years ago and all the gold ads while gold was up at sixteen or $1,700 an ounce. I mean, there's a meaningful element of folks that, that, that seem to have put into the back burner the concept that we might be spending too much as a country and countries might be spending too much as a globe. And although we've backed off of that a little bit as interest rates have cured, the the specter of a potential meaningful rise in interest rates because of the debt loads that we carry as sovereign nations is still out there. And so although we hope that we land this kind of sweet Goldilocks landing of up 100, 200, 300 basis points, these are all really nice, comfortable scenarios that we can argue about at cocktail parties. But the reality is, is that something could go wrong and we could get a much more meaningful spike in interest rates, and we've seen that in our history not too long ago. So I just want to keep that on the table, that the R200 to 250, that's not a scary scenario for us. That's a comfortable scenario for us. Things could actually go awry. So on the other side of the coin, we think there's a lot of good news. We think that real GDP is probably on the rise globally, the World Bank, we like their number. They've actually had a pretty sage viewpoint on the world um, over the last few years. Shows that the U.S. Uh, net GDP, real GDP, will grow from 1.8% last year to 2.8% this year. Global GDP rising another half point to 3.2. We see the emerging market economies in the 4% range. And we've got some other indicators at North Pier that we follow pretty closely that we think this might actually be understated by about three to five tenths of a, of a percent. We're looking for the U.S. somewhere in the low twos. Or I'm sorry, low threes for the next eight. I'm sorry, the next 12 months. So that's not calendar year 2013, but you know maybe the next four quarters. This is really important to notice. Household balance sheets have never been as good as they are right now. Debt is low, assets are high, and that makes consumer confidence setting new highs make very logical connection. So as though as people feel. People spend, as people feel, people invest. Real estate, both residentially and commercially, continues to show strong improvements. We're taking a little bit of a risk from a meteoric rise in some of the, uh, the Sun Belt markets like California, Arizona, Florida, uh, but the rest of the country's ascent has been more moderate and more consistent. The Case-Shiller Index was up almost 14% last year. Domestic energy, this is a big story if you're not watching it, folks. Oil imports are heading way, way down at the same time that petroleum product exports are surging. That's a beautiful pickup. I don't know if a lot of you know this or not, but petroleum products like gasoline are actually one of the largest exports of the United States. And we've been talking about for a long time how much we import and how important that is. 
Well, it's also important to look at how much we actually export. A lot of other encouraging data, the employment situation, you probably caught this about a week and a half ago, unemployment down to 6.3%, still not a great number, but just from the end of 2012, down from, uh, from 7.9. Globally, business to business conditions are accelerating. We've got some really interesting statistics about this. We're happy to share with you if you want to send us an email. But basically, we track individual company purchasing managers index to find out how business conditions are country by country. And what we're seeing is globally, we're seeing generally favorable business conditions and surging to new highs. Really good to see because if the globe continues to participate wholly, obviously that's good for everybody's equity values. So one of the big questions that we get is, well, as interest rates are rising, isn't there an old saying about don't fight the Fed? As interest rates go up, don't stock prices go down? JP Morgan put out a really interesting uh, survey back, uh, I should say a study back about a quarter ago that we really picked up and then actually looked at a little bit deeper that shows that when interest rates are rising off of very low rates, coming up from the twos and the threes and the low four percents, that stock market prices have always gone up. As long as you're under about 4.3% in interest in the interest rates on the 10-year treasury as you rise, important, as you rise, uh, then equity prices have always done well. So there's a lot going on in this chart, but I'm going to walk you through it all. This is that what is the sweet spot, how do we get there, what does it look like, and what are all the key components. Well, we talked about them all in pieces, but now I want you to see where they may line up, and obviously this is not the scale. We've talked about interest rates, the purple line. Right now we're on the way up, coming out of 2013. Hopefully at some point in time, whether it's 16, 17, 2018, 19, 20, at some point in time, we're going to reach this flattening point of the apex. So you want to pay attention to that or have advisors that are looking at that for you. Once the low-hanging fruit of interest rate rises is picked, then you probably are getting pretty close to lows on your PBOs and hopefully helping your funding ratios um, as best as interest rates can impact them at that point in time. Also, annuity purchases and lump sum payments should be approaching the lower levels at that point in time. Assets of the plan, hopefully, like I said, if the globe continues to look pretty good during that time period, interest rates would go up because the globe's doing well. These things are not disconnected. They actually should run hand in hand to a certain extent, highly correlated. You should end up with a nice move up in, asset, in the assets of the plan around the same time period. The line will probably not look that pretty. Um, it will have some, jig, uh, some zigs and some zags, but generally speaking, um, we think that they will generally follow each other. At the same time, your PBO should continue to decline. Those pension obligations hopefully will continue to get lower, and your funding ratios should, should improve. What does that mean? Well, you're going to have to contribute cash along the way. So clearly, as we get out last year, not a good time to get out of the, the plan. Your net cost determination, very high. This year, like I said, the average plan still has to write a check for about 30% of what their obligation is to get out. But as interest rates go up and as asset rates go, uh, uh, as assets of the plan rise, hopefully our net contributions, when you add it all up, should actually decline to wherever this sweet spot is. And possibly, by the way, be careful because if I extend this chart out more, and again, this 2017 number is a plus or minus. We really don't know where that day is. This could actually start to ski jump and you could start to climb again. If we, and I should say when we, get back into recession, there'll be one eventually one day, interest rates will start going the other way. Stock prices will start going the other way. And guess what will happen to this line? Your net costs will actually start to climb. So you probably don't want to get too aggressive on trying to cherry pick that absolute bottom if you're looking for the sweet spot. And, you know, I guess we're going to get into a question here um, talking about one more item, which is, uh, the PBGC premiums, because right around 2016, as I mentioned, those PBGCs are really going to kick up, and that is possibly something that also impacts the sweet spot. If we get really, really lucky, then we're going to get some curing that's going to happen that make those premiums not effective for all that long. So in a perfect world, uh, things won't last much longer than that 2017, 2018 range, and maybe even a little quicker 
Um, but I think that's super optimistic. So let me give you a little briefing. For those of you who don't know the actual numbers that are associated with the P, uh, PBGC premiums uh, that are coming out, and I guess maybe by way of backdrop, because a large factor of this premium is, let me pop these in here real quick. So for those of you who don't know, there's a, there's a, there's a, new, uh, there's a new Bipartisan Budget Act 2013 that actually, so you all know that, um, that PBGC premiums were already raised pretty substantively this last round, uh, going up to $50 per person in 2015. Now we're talking about with the BBA of a $64 number per participant in 2016. This is the big number with the new BBA regulation or uh, uh, proposal that, 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 that's pushed through, is we're actually looking at a jump to 2.9% of underfunded asset, of the underfunded amount of your assets is going to be assessed by uh, PBGC. 2.9%, we're going to get into that in a second, but that's a big, big number. That's better than triple what it was just a few years ago. Let me take the last poll of the day because this is going to impact what, what you know, our advice is for the typical organization and something that you should be looking at um, in, your, uh, in your analysis of what to do next. Uh, let me introduce the question just simply of plan funding. Kelly, I'm having a hard time finding that one. Did it disappear on us? I just launched it for you. Uh, okay. We've got some Thank participants you. coming in now. Great. I can't, so, Kelly, if you'll do me a favor, for some reason that's not popping up on my screen, so I'll let you uh, announce, the, uh, announce the results of that one. Okay. We'll give everybody just another few seconds to vote. The question is, how well funded is your plan on an accounting basis? Okay, and we will go ahead and close this poll. And we've got no one funded better than 110%. About a little over half of you have uh, it 90% to 100%. And then the other half of you are split between 100 and 110% and 80% and 90%. Well, great. So um, for those of you who are underfunded, um, this is only going to apply for the underfunded folks. For those of you that are near or fully funded, that's, that's fantastic. The PBGC con uh, uh, concept of this is not going to apply to you, or at least hopefully won't, uh, as long as you maintain that funding status. Well, one of the concepts that you really want to look at is contributions that are made before 2016 and even 2015, because the numbers do jump up, are actually going to have the effect of a 2.9% actual return on assets. A dollar saved is, an, is a dollar earned, right? So if you don't have to pay that 2.9% underfunded premium, that variable premium to PBGC, that's like making 2.9% on that investment. So if you put in $10 million, it's the equivalent of making 2.9% on that $10 million. So for some organizations who are underfunded, especially those that are underfunded in the you know, sub-90% range, Definitely time to take a look and see where you might be able to increase some funding because you're going to get some good bang for your buck. On top of you know, all the other benefits of, of maintaining higher funding ratios, it's just simple good economics. If you're looking to terminate your plan, I certainly would love to get an extra 2.9%. Even if you went out and invested, and we're not, we're not stating that you probably should take a look at this, but even if you made 3% on a treasury bond on top of that 2.9%, that's like a 6% return, quote unquote, guaranteed. So if you're in stocks or if you're even in lower, uh, lower duration uh, fixed income investments, you know, you can see how those returns can really start to add up. The other concept, I'm not going to get into too much detail today, but for those of you who have not con contemplated, take a look at um, vested terminal, uh, terminated cash outs uh, for your folks that would qualify that have smaller balances. Now, most plans do push out those people that have $5,000 in accumulated benefit or less, but look at those folks that might have six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars 
an accumulated benefit because if you can actually get those folks out of your plan through that, um, that vested terminated process, you can actually save $64 per participant plus if whatever portion of the underfunded status that their balance ends up representing. Plus on top of that, if you get enough people out of the plan, you can probably go back if you're not priced this way already and renegotiate some of your administrative costs. So you have three ways to save there. And in a lot of cases, um, it represents a lot of people, but not necessarily a ton of assets. So it can be very, very effective in reducing both costs as well as administrative burden. And at the end, when you're going to terminate, to have those people already out of the plan can be very, very helpful in the process. Just by way of comparison, and I by no means want to uh, reflect that this is an apples to apples type scenario, but if long bonds in an LDI strategy are yielding less than 4% right now, and they've got all that huge duration risk, putting you at risk of losing 12.5% on long bonds in a year like 2013, doesn't it kind of make sense to look at ways that we can make an easy three and change percent? I think it probably does for some organizations. So. Now for some of you, and I don't have a poll around this one, but we'll just leave this as food for thought because I think that this will probably for some make a lot of sense instantly, and for others this will be something that possibly plants an acorn that will grow over time. So now that we know that, okay, getting out is an option, getting out, or de-risking and waiting for the right time to get out is an option, and then timing our exits an option, what about the concept of, okay, I'm with you all the way to timing. I get that there's a sweet spot. I get that the odds are probably pretty decently in our favor that we can find it somewhere out in the future or at least get close to it. Well, what can I do if I want to be tactical about finding that sweet spot? What can I do about actually gearing my portfolio better in order to take advantage of that? Well, I'm going to give this whole list of caveats. I'm not going to actually read through every single one of them. But before you contemplate additional risk at any level in your defined benefit plan, whether you employed LDI or not, whether you're 60-40 or 40-60, whatever you're doing in your portfolios presently, make sure the sponsor and the committee, and if you have consultants, thoroughly examine these items. Net cost through termination, that's what this is all about. How much does it really cost to get out of my plan? Cash flow, variability, budgeting, risk administration burdens on staff and costs, regulatory liabilities, not just the PBGC, we got the DOL and the IRS that we're living with every single day we operate one of these DB plans. And then culturally, some organizations, it's a cultural benefit to have that plan, even if it's frozen. In some organizations, it's actually a cultural detriment. It's something they have to talk about that takes bandwidth away from other, idea, uh, other, other topics. Assuming you get through that myriad of topics and you still want to examine the possibility of re-risking, these are the things that you want to look at. Asset allocation. Well, so we are an actual over-consultant. I know that's a weird concept, but we're an over-consultant on plans that have some of the large national organizations that are advising or actually running portions or all of their defined benefit plans. And a lot of these large national organizations are introducing in their capital markets assumptions and modeling. They are introducing 10 to 20 year market cycles. And especially when they talk about things like OLDI and long-term bond investing, it's fine um, because eventually interest rates will go up and you'll make it back on the interest. Well, that doesn't marry up really well with an organization that's actually trying to terminate their plan in three to four years because they won't be around long enough to collect those coupons of those higher, uh, those higher coupon bonds. So, Take a look. If you're actually looking to get out in 2017 or 18, take a look and make sure that your allocation isn't looking at 20-year time horizons and normalized markets because that's most likely not what we're in right now. Certainly the 2008-2009 period wasn't. Certainly the recovery period wasn't. 2013 wasn't. And I'm pretty comfortable to say that the next three to four years are probably not going to be quite typical either. Certainly, we should be looking at different time horizons, and if we're going to do that, possibly even be more tactical in looking at what makes sense today. If we think interest rates are going up, and that poll just shows that over a third of you think it's going up over 2%, then shouldn't we be factoring that into our, our allocations? If the World Bank is right and we do have GDPs swelling as much as they're, they're expected to, then ultimately, 
shouldn't we be addressing that in our allocations as well? This is the big one. Even if you've already employed LDI, some organizations are actually stepping away from it. We actually have an organization that we're working with right now that is taking an LDI strategy that they acquired through acquisition and they're taking it off the table as we speak. If we think interest rates are going up, don't we want to get out of the way of that move? Again, if you did employ an LDI strategy and you're the average organization that had 30% of their, of their uh, total investments in, in, in long-term fixed income last year, there's a 300 basis point give up in performance. And so if we think there's another 200 basis points coming, you can do the math. And as I mentioned, contemplate accelerated funding. You know, I'm going to go back to the LDI topic and just add a little bit more detail. You can actually not just only eliminate LDI, but for those organizations that don't currently even deploy it or those organizations that may want to abandon it, it's not even just about necessarily even going to an intermediate duration fixed income portfolio. You could even get more tactical. If you're not too excited about making 3% on a 10-year treasury, then maybe it's better to take very little risk and just make 2%. And so those are the kind of concepts that you might want to look at. It's not just about buying more stocks. As a matter of fact, we think the first place to quote unquote re-risk is by, we think, de-risking the long end of fixed income investments. But as we mentioned, there's probably some free government cheese to be had in avoiding some of those penalties for those underfunded plans and the PBGC premium. So we've only got about five more minutes left, and I'm going to leave you with this concept, which is, okay, so we like the idea of at least cherry picking and looking for that sweet spot and possibly going a little bit deeper and looking at the concept of re-risking or becoming more tactical. How do we do it? Well, that's tricky. And so really what I'm here to tell you about is just giving you some sage advice on when you're out there asking people that question, how to look at the answers and who you're speaking with. Take everything with a grain of salt if it deserves to be taken with a grain of salt. So who are our service providers that we're currently working with? Obviously actuaries, compliance consultants, those are the same people or same organizations frequently. The folks that are actually running or advising on your money either discretionarily under ERISA 338 where they're actually taking full responsibility or partially full responsibility for running the assets or your consultants that are operating under ERISA 321. The folks that give you advice on asset allocation, and by the way, um, take a really close look to find out whether you're actually getting management of your asset allocation, because that, by the way, for those of you who don't know, asset allocation represents over 90% of the variability of your returns. Again, when we talked about what happened last year, um, you can imagine that where you set bonds and stocks or long versus short had a lot more to do with whether you had a good growth manager or not. And so... You want to look at who's giving you advice on that asset allocation and what their legal standing is. A lot of organizations provide in your contract, they say they provide information. That's not the same thing legally as advice. Some organizations provide advice under 321, and some organizations actually, and very few of them uh, will do this, will take full discretion of your asset allocation. But at the end of the day, all these organizations have a vested interest in your plan continuing. That's where those fees come from. If they come to you tomorrow and say, now's the time to hit the button and terminate your plan, their fees stop as soon as you do. So make sure that you at least temper the advice that you're getting and knowing that even if they have the best intent, that, that subconsciously there may be, or, or, or potentially organizationally, there may actually be a, um, uh, uh, a cultural bias. How about the other side of the coin? Well, terminal funding providers and annuity consultants and brokers, guess that what they want you to do? They only make money if you terminate. So we have to look at any advice that they give us in terms of timing and in terms of finding that sweet spot as such. ERISA attorneys can be great. They certainly are your advocates, but most of them lack capital market expertise to give you that kind of advice. So wherever you do seek this advice, just make sure, consider the source, consider the motivation, and make good, sage decisions. So I have a bunch of slides in here that are about the timeline for termination and the things that you need to do. I'm actually, after the presentation's over, we're going to scroll through them in about 30-second increments just so they're in the recording, and then if you want to replay this, you'll have that information and you can press pause. Um, so at this point in time, I'm actually going to just stop, and I'm going to turn this over to questions. We're right at coming up on the one-hour mark. 
I'll stick around for another 10 or 15 minutes in case we do have any questions that we can ask, but I'm going to thank those who do need to hop off the call for other obligations for doing so now. So Kelly, you want to open this up to questions? Thank you so much, Jim. Such good information. We have received um, one question so far, and folks, if you've got others, feel free to type them in uh, in the Q&A pane at the bottom of your screen. Um, but while others are doing that, Jim, one question we've received is, what are you seeing with asset allocation in the DB plans that you advise? Oh, um, that's, that's a really good question. Actually, so by the way, in, in addition to the, the quote-unquote boring housekeeping stuff, we also threw some support slides in the back of this as well. Um, and I think we put something in, which was a national study that, JC, uh, that JP Morgan uh, released. Yeah, here it is. Um, so I, I'd rather talk about what we're seeing out in the field, because we see a very wide swath of asset allocation, um, both tactically and strategically. Um, but this is what JP Morgan just released. Um, they're seeing the typical plan presently on the defined benefit side is just a tad under 50% equity allocated, a uh, little less than 40% fixed income. Uh, there's been some utilization of hedge funds, which were actually a drag on performance last year at about 5%, and then the rest is sprinkled among private equity, real estate, uh, and, then, and then cash. I will give a quick caveat. For organizations that are dealing with the medium size to small size defined benefit plan, these esoteric asset classes, the hedge funds, commodity funds, private equity, they sound great. Um, the sell on them is really interesting in terms of shifting efficient frontiers and getting more return for, rest, for less. But when you actually start looking at some of the fees that are layered in on some of these funds of funds, um, they can really kill a lot of the alpha. Um, so definitely uh, be very, very uh, uh, judicious in your application of seeking the advantages of alternative investments um, and make sure that you're not paying too much uh, for the concept of shifting your returns uh, to the left uh, and taking less risk and up and getting more return um, because fees might, might be a, a pullback from there. But that's, that's a great question. Um, tactically for what we're advising our clients on uh, is we've actually been very, very light for about four years now on international equities. Uh, we're looking uh, for for an increase in European economies uh, in the near term. And so we're actually redeploying to what was an overweight for a decade, has been an underweight for about four years. We're actually looking to equally weight there. And then we're liking what we're seeing in commodity prices coming back. Uh, and so we're, we're actually, for our pension plans that we discretionarily manage, we're very close to seeding what has been an underweight in emerging markets equities uh, with an overweight. So we're actually going for a full underweight. We'll be stepping in through full weighting and then to an overweight probably in the next 12 to 18 months. Any other questions? Well, thanks, folks. Again, um, we will make sure that we, uh, that we provide this deck for everybody. And we welcome any comments or questions. Uh, and uh, and we're, we're happy to be a resource to you. Uh, we know that this topic is timely for some and is more intellectual for others. Uh, but to have this as a primer going forward, we help gives you a perspective that maybe you're not seeing uh, in the main, mainstream advice circles. Thank you so much, Jim, and thank you, audience, for joining us today. Please take a moment to complete the brief survey. If you stick around with us till the end after Jim scrolls through all the slides, it will pop up when we end the webinar. Um, but we'll also send you a link in the email that we send you tomorrow. Um, Hope you all have a great afternoon. And again, Jim, thanks for some really great information. Thanks, Kelly.
Okay, thanks again, and we hope to see you soon at another webinar or one of our future conferences.